It is my privilege and honor to introduce a dear friend, a longtime conference scaler uh, who I have argued with many times at the Afterglow, uh, <laughs> but never quarreled. Um, and uh, she is a wonderful columnist, popular columnist for our magazine, Gilbert Magazine, which if you don't receive and read, uh, see a member of staff and they will correct that for you. <laughs> Uh, she writes on the topic of distributism or localism, Chesterton's philosophy of uh, keeping government the right size and keeping people uh, empowered and, and kings and queens in their own domain, or as Susan likes to say, domestic emperors and empresses. Uh, and so, please welcome Susan Suter. <laughs> to talk with you today about distributism. I was thinking about what I wanted to talk about. And, um, and I hear a lot of discussion about consumer behavior. I hear a lot of discussion about employment when we're discussing these large economic ideas. But when I read the papal encyclicals that were the foundation for this philosophy, I see a lot of talk about morality about humanity and about the family. So this is my focus, but, but first I'm gonna tell you what I'm not gonna talk about. So that's the first part of the talk, is like what I'm not gonna talk about and then I'm gonna tell you what I'm gonna talk about. So, all right, we need to define terms. I, I run a local Chesterton Society and this is, it's always predicated like let's define terms because we can't talk about what we're talking about unless we know what we're talking about. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So we're starting with socialism. A lot of people hear distributism and then they're amazed. Oh, you're, I mean, I've been accused of being a Marxist at my own Chester Society. <laughs> <laughs> Susan, pray for peace. Okay, okay. socialism. <laughs> socialism is a political and economic theory of social organization which advocates the means of production, distribution, and exchange should be owned or regulated by the community as a whole. And, and that ends, ends up being power, you know, coalesced in the government, right? So this was, this was something that the, um, the popes have consistently spoken out about. The socialism transfers the possessions from the laborer to the state, that they would become communal property of all to be administered by the state or municipal bodies. They use class warfare to stimulate discontent and enmity between the upper and lower classes. Because if they've got us fighting against each other, they can, they can pretty much do what they want. We, we sometimes see this even in America. Capitalism, all right, that's our next, our next enemy, which, I mean, don't all leave the room right now because I don't really like our capitalism, so you gotta bear with me. Um, it's an economic and political system in which a country's trade and industry are controlled by private owners for profit. Okay, so this similarly abuses the worker by reducing him to his labor, which can be exploited and profited from. Very few own the means of production, and the vast majority of workers are only paid a wage, with no real ownership at all. Chesterton describes it this way. The capitalists lured men into the town with promise of greater pleasures. They ruined them there, and left them with only one pleasure, they found the increase, and it produced at first convenient for labor and then inconvenient for supply. And now they are ready to round off their experiment in a highly appropriate manner by telling them that they must have no families or that their families must go to the modern equivalent of Botany Bay. All right, that's the penal colony. All right, we're, we're enslaving people with capitalism. Now, distributism, on the other hand, is the third way. It's an economic theory in which the means of production are widely distributed. Distributism has its roots in Catholic social teaching. Okay, this is where it started, which challenges both socialism and laissez-faire capitalism, or liberalism as it's referred to in Rerum Novarum. It was first suggested by Pope Leo XIII in Rerum Novarum, and it's, in its opening lines, Leo notes that there is a spirit of revolutionary change which has long been disturbing the nations of the world. 
As our world lurched from monarchy to republics and democracies, it became clear that we might be exchanging submission to a monarch for slavery to economic systems and totalitarian governments. In this new context, it was necessary for the church to weigh in on how those new systems might be more just and conform most, more closely to natural law. Okay, so it was developed then by Hilaire Balak and G.K. Chesterton. Okay, so another thing that this is not gonna be, I'm not an academic, so I'm gonna give you like an overview and I'm sure that there are at least 50% of you that know a lot of this a lot better than me, but this is, this is kind of uh, from a laywoman's perspective. Um, how, how this applies to the home. So, at the end of the 19th century, Pope Leo XIII felt a need to respond to the exploitation that was occurring as a result of the Industrial Revolution. Guilds that used to protect tradesmen were being dissolved, and as labor became more automated and unskilled, capitalists were exploiting laborers. As horrible as this was, the socialist answer proposed by Marx and others was even more alarming. So much so that Leo and others have consistently declared that Catholicism and socialism are completely incompatible. That's capital. Right. If socialism, like all errors, contains some truth, which moreover the supreme pontiffs have never denied, it is based nevertheless on a theory of human society peculiar to itself and irreconcilable with true Christianity. Religious socialism, Christian socialism, are contradictory terms. No one can be, at the same time, a good Catholic and a true socialist. Now this is quadragesimo anno, so that means 40 years. So this is, again, 1931. Rerum Navarum was in 1891. Chesterton wrote Outline of Sanity in 1927. So you can see the context there. Um, so. Oh, this is, yes, this is interesting. So I wanted to share this. This is kind of an aside, but um, this is the telegram, okay, that Pope Leo XI, the the, or Pope Pius XI, the author of Quadragesimo Anno, so we're talking 40 years after Rerum Navarum, this is a teaching on social justice, the one where he was talking about the socialists. He um, sent a, a telegram upon the death of G.K. Chesterton, not to Francis, okay? You see that it's not addressed to Francis. Who's it addressed to? The, well, to the people of England. Let's read it. Hello, Holy Father, deeply grieved. Death, Mr. Gilbert Keith Chesterton, devoted son. Holy Church, gifted defender of the Catholic faith. Stop. Now, who was the last gifted defender of the Catholic faith? Henry, Henry VIII. VIII. King Henry VIII. Okay. <laughs> so, so it was actually so scandalous to the sensibilities of of the British public that this wasn't even published because this was this was Henry VIII's title. This wasn't something to be bandied about. But I mean, it shows you the esteem with which Pius XI saw Chesterton and you know his economic theories because you see. 1927, Chesterton wrote Outline of Sanity, and in 1931, Pope Leo XI um, reflects a lot of the same thought in, in his encyclical um, commemorating the anniversary of the original Rerum Navarum. So, okay, again, His Holiness offers paternal sympathy people of England, okay, not, not Francis. He knew that Chesterton was more than the spouse of Francis, and the condolences were to be offered to an entire country. Assures prayers, dear departed, bestows apostolic benediction. Cardinal Pacelli. Okay, so who's Cardinal Pacelli? Pius the 12th. Pius the 12th, all right? So he has some really serious fans, and I just think that's amazing, you know, that, that, that when we talk about, just as an aside, you know, maybe this man being recognized universally for his holiness. We got a couple of advocators right there. <laughs> Isn't that beautiful? All right. So anyway, um, where are we now? Okay. Chesterton saw problems. Pope Pius XI saw problems. Leo XIII, Hilaire Belloc. Well, has it gotten better? Or maybe it's about the same. We live right now in an age of increasing totalitarianism. Certain rights we as Americans have held inviolated are being violated with impunity. For the first time ever, 
That's what this chart shows. A majority of Americans support not just tech companies, but the government restricting false information online. I find this terrifying that our First Amendment is not, is not seen as a more universal right. Not only is freedom of speech being restricted, but American citizens unaware of the importance of free speech to the survival of a republic are voluntarily abandoning their rights and heading towards the abyss. Supranational organizations like the World Economic Forum encourage conformity and compliance to everything from lockdowns to forced medical procedures and even to economic policies. <laughs> An aptly named supervillain, Klaus Schwab, <laughs> like, did, they, did they get him from central casting? That's what I want to know. <laughs> Is he being had like the outfit? <laughs> You'll own nothing and be happy, okay? You'll own nothing and be happy. Well, let's compare this to what Chesterton said in the outline of sanity, our, our favorite prophet. If we proceed at present in a proper orderly fashion, the very idea of property will vanish. It is not revolutionary violence that will destroy it. It is rather the desperate and reckless habit of not having a revolution. The world will be occupied or rather is already occupied by two powers, which are now one power. The world made by the collusion of big government and big business is becoming more and more fixed and familiar. It will be a world of organization or syndication, of standardization. People will be able to get hats, houses, holidays, and patent medicines of a recognized and universal pattern. They will be fed, clothed, educated, and examined by a wide and elaborate system. But if you were to ask them at any given moment whether the agency which housed or hatted them was still merely mercantile or had become municipal, they probably would not know, and they possibly would not care. Sounds familiar. One of the biggest indicators that a society is in decline is falling birth rates. When we have decided that it is no longer worth it to reproduce ourselves, we are in major trouble. All across the Western world, with very few exceptions, birth rates are below replacement levels. If we have, as a society have decided that it is not worth it to have children, then we have lost our hope. Today, more and more women choose to remain child-free. What, a, what an oxymoron. They say they would not want to bring children into this world because it is too terrible. This is a sign of a civilization in decline. Many women avoid becoming, taking a mother, be, avoid becoming a mother by taking birth control. Some even resort to violence through abortion to avoid bringing children into the world. Similarly, many people don't have a desire to create anything anymore. They are information workers and consumers of goods. There is no generative force behind their actions. Okay, I promise it'll get better later. <laughs> <laughs> this is a chart, it's going down. <laughs> so you need to know. <laughs> These are some of our some of our big friends. I just I'm not going to talk a lot about this, but I want to give you a couple Chesterton quotes while you're staring at these images so you can kind of like see if it resonates. You know, I think, I think the more things change, the more they stay the same sometimes. It is perfectly obvious that the whole business is a machine for manufacturing 10th rate things and keeping people ignorant of first rate things. Think about the people at Walmart when you think of this. Thus, even in the crowds that throng the big, big shops, you do in fact hear a vast amount of grumbling at the big shops. Not so much because they are big, as because they are bad. Okay, and of course, Amazon is just a, a you know, a large international, it's conglomerating that power, and uh, so I put that up there, but I don't want to think about that too much more anymore. Okay, so even, even our money is make-believe. 
You know, it's not, it's not based on a standard, it's a fiat currency. Things have become even worse since Chesterton time, but our currency is more of an idea than something real. This is how he describes it. A stockbroker, in one sense, is really a very poetical figure. In one sense, he is poetical as Shakespeare, and his ideal poet, since he does give to airy nothing a local habitation and a name, he does deal to a great extent in what economists, in their poetical way, describe as imaginaries. When he exchanges 2,000 Patagonian pumpkins for 1,000 Sharon's in Alaskan whale blubber, he does not demand the sensual satisfaction of eating the pumpkin or need to behold the whale with the gross eye of flesh. It is quite possible that there are no pumpkins. And if there is somewhere some thing as a whale, it is very unlikely to obtrude itself upon the conversation in a stock exchange. <laughs> now what is the matter with the financial world is that this is a great deal too full of imagination in the sense of fiction. And when we react against it, we naturally in the first place react into realism. We are tempted into the world of theoreticals. Many Americans are in finance and information. We are not dealing with a material world, but an imaginary one, just like our currency. We are in danger of losing touch with the material world and all the good that comes with it. As Chesterton reminds us, oh, we already read that one, so I'm gonna skip around. Children left to themselves, almost invariably invent games of their own, dramas of their own, often whole imaginary kingdoms and commonwealths of their own. In other words, they produce, and the, till the competition of monopoly kills their production. The boy playing at robbers is not liberated, but stunted by learning about American crooks, all of a one pattern less picturesque than his own. He is psychologically undercut, undersold, dumped upon, frozen out, flooded, swamped, and ruined. I think he's making a good point there. <laughs> but not emancipated. Imagine, inventions have destroyed invention. The big modern machines are like big guns, dominating and terrorizing a whole stretch of country, within the range of which nothing can raise its head. There is far more inventiveness to the square yard of mankind than can ever appear under that monopolist terror. The minds of men are not so much alike as the motor cars of men, or the morning papers of men, or the mechanical manufacturers of the coats and hats of men. In other words, we are not getting the best out of men. We are certainly not getting the most individual or the most interesting qualities out of men, and it is doubtful whether we ever shall until we shut off this deafening din of megaphones that drowns their voices, this deathly glare of limelight which kills the colors of their complexions, this plangent yell of platitudes which stuns and stops their minds. All this sort of thing is killing thoughts as they grow as a great white death ray might kill plants as they grow. When therefore people tell me that I am making a great part of England rustic and self-supporting, would mean making it rude and senseless, I do not agree with them. And I do not think they understand the alternative or the problem. Nobody wants all men to be rustics, even in normal times. It is very tenable that some of the most intelligent would turn to the towns even in normal times. But I say the towns themselves are the foes of intelligence. In these times, I say the rustics themselves would have more variety and vivacity than is really encouraged in these towns. I say it is only by shutting off this unnatural noise and light that men's minds can begin again to move and to grow. Just as we spread paving stones over different soils without reference to the different crops that might grow there, so we spread programs of platitudinous platitud platitud plutocracy. Say that three times fast. That's your um, Over souls that God made various, 
and simpler societies have made free. Okay? There's too much noise for us to think in this modern culture. We run here, we run there. How are we going to break out of that? We have so much, so much that we've enslaved ourselves. Pope Pius XI clearly was a fan of Chesterton. This is a passage from Quadragesimo Anno, 1931, published four years after Outline of Sanity. The ultimate consequences of the individualist spirit in economic life are those which you yourselves, venerable brethren and beloved children, see and deplore. Free competition has destroyed itself. Economic dictatorship has supplanted the free market. Unbridled ambition for power has likewise succeeded greed for gain. All economic life has become tragically hard, inexorable, and cruel. To these are to be added the grave evils that have resulted from an intermingling and shameful confusion of the functions and duties of public authority with those in the economic sphere. Okay. He sees it. Such as one of the worst, the virtual degradation of the majesty of the state, which although it ought to sit high on high like a queen and supreme arbitress, free from all partiality and intent upon the one common good and justice, is become a slave, surrendered and delivered to the passions and greed of men. Okay. Just check certain people's stock portfolio and see if you agree <laughs> in, our, in our own government. There is a need for change. Yes, some of the changes need to be made at an institutional level. There are many politicians and economists working on these types of solutions. There's large ways to implement distributism. I'm gonna go through a couple, but just to let you know that that's not what I'm gonna talk about. <laughs> the American Solidarity Party is a party based in Catholic social teaching. They take Rerum and Avarum and Quadragesimo Anno and Centissimus Annus and all of it, and they say, this is, this is what we believe, okay? They are committed to the betterment of our nation and world through prudent policies guided by Christian democratic values. Their platform is founded on the belief that all people are created with an equal and inviolable dignity before God. Our shared nature as image bearers is the source of our rights as individuals. This is all solid teaching. It also demands that we pursue justice together at whatever levels of government or society responds best to the needs of our families and communities. That's the principle of subsidiarity. Recognizing that governments derive their just authority from God, we seek laws and policies that put the universal call to love our neighbor into practice by promoting authentic human freedom and flourishing. That, that certainly would be acting like in a majestic fashion. Another option that has been discussed at this conference in an excellent way is employee stock ownership plans. I mean, this is a way that uh, employees can directly own the means of production through participating in the ownership of the companies that they are working for. This is um, suggested in Quadragesimo Anno, the work contract be somewhat modified by a partnership contract, as is already being done in various ways and with no small advantage to workers and owners. Workers and other employees thus become sharers in ownership or management and participate in some fashion in the profits received. So this is, this is again, an idea that's it's great. I, you know, but it's just not what I'm going to talk about. <laughs> Buy local. I mean, this is the first thing we think of when we talk about localism. Oh, I finally said localism. Sorry, yes. This is about <laughs> localism, which is what the, what the society is calling what used to be called distributism. So localism demands that we, um, you know, it corresponds to the principle of subsidiarity if you go buy the beer from the guy down the street than if you're going to buy a beer made in um, a plant uh, uh, across the country and then shipped to you. It's certainly better for the environment. And I think it's very easy for us to see how uh, buying local is a distributist idea. But it's tempted to focus solely on these large solutions because we like easy answers. And many of these ideas for most of the, us are largely theoretical. I don't own a business, so I don't have to worry about how I'm going to incorporate that ESOP, right? If we are not owners of capital or politicians with huge amounts of power, there is no action required on our part. The problem is that the changes that are necessary are individual. While larger structures are necessary, individual conviction and moral choices 
are necessary for a distributist or localist system to flourish. What needs changing is us. There is a moral solution to these economic problems. It is more difficult to attain and requires much more personal sacrifice. But that is our task. Chesterton tells us that distributism demands that we cultivate our tastes and refuse to be dictated to by those who would seek to control us through technology. As he points out in Babies and Distributism, what makes me want to walk over such people like doormats is that they use the word brave. By every act of that sort, they chain themselves to the most servile and mechanical system yet tolerated by men. The cinema is a machine for unrolling certain regular patterns called pictures, expressing the most vulgar millionaire's notion of the taste of the most vulgar millions. The gramophone is a machine for recording such tunes as certain shops and other organizations choose to sell. The wireless is better, but even that is marked by the modern mark of all three. The impotence of the receptive party. The amateur cannot challenge the actor. The householder will find it in vain to go and shout into the gramophone. The mob cannot pelt the modern speaker, especially when he is a loudspeaker. It is all a central mechanism, giving out to men exactly what their masters think they should have. As Pope Pius XI says in his encyclical Quadragesimo Anno, in order that what Pope Leo XIII so happily established in Rerum Novarum, that what remains to be done may be accomplished, and that even more copious and richer benefits may accrue to the family of mankind, two things are especially necessary. Reform of institutions, which we're not going to talk about, and correction of morals. It is in this correction of morals that the battle lies. And this can only be done in the family. As I've demonstrated, little has changed from Chesterton's time, but we must pick up this fight and carry on. I think I've pretty well described the current situation with some help from Chesterton, Pope Leo XIII, and Pius XI, and maybe I should take an intermission so we can all have a Prozac. <laughs> nope. But instead, I'm gonna tell you a little funny story um, that was an anecdote from Chesterton's life, many of you may have heard it before, but it was related in TP's Weekly in 1914. It is recorded, however, on one occasion, visitors arrived, and Mrs. Chesterton, being called upon to play the part of the hostess, was unable to accompany her husband. With the words, now Gilbert, you know where you are to lecture and what your subject is, Chesterton went to the, er, Chesterton went to the railway station. Arriving there, he banged down a sovereign at the booking office and said, a ticket. <laughs> Wherefore, asked the astonished clerk. Free trade hall, replied Chesterton. Oh, Glasgow then, said the clerk, and Chesterton, assenting, received a ticket for the station. Stepping onto the street at Glasgow, he was hailed by a friend. Hello, Chesterton, what are you doing here? Oh, I'm, I'm lecturing at free trade at hall. Oh, no you're not, said the friend. Oh, yes I am, protested Chesterton. I booked the engagement some months ago. But you cannot be, maintained the friend, for the place is being renovated and the painters are in. It slowly dawned on Chesterton that he was at the wrong place, and he, further to justify his claim to greatness, sent a telegram to his wife. I'm here. Where ought I be? <laughs> so, we have seen where we are. The question before us is, where ought we be? Chesterton says in The Common Man, men have always one of two things, either a conscious and complete philosophy or the unconscious acceptance of the broken bits of some incomplete and shattered and often discredited philosophy. So what I'm asking you to is not to take what I'm about to say as a prescriptive model, but just as a as fodder for meditation about how you might implement localism and the development of the moral imagination in your own lives and in your own way. All right, I'm starting with babies. <laughs> babies are good. Yay! Yay! I'm starting with.
with babies because babies are the beginning of everything. As Chesterton says, we shall never return to social sanity till we begin at the beginning. We must start where all history starts, with a man and a woman and a child, and with the province of liberty and property, which these need for their full humanity. A child, as Chesterton reminds us in Babies and Distributism, is the very sign and sacrament of personal freedom. He is a fresh and free will added to the wills of the world. He is something that his parents have freely chosen to produce and which they freely agree to protect. They can feel that any amusement he gives, which is often considerable, really comes from him and not from them and from nobody else. He has been born without the intervention of any master or lord. He is a creation and a contribution. He is their own creative contribution to creation. He is also a much more beautiful, wonderful, amusing, and astonishing thing than any of the stale stories or jingling jazz tunes turned out by the machines. When men no longer feel that he is so, they have lost the appreciation of primary things and therefore all sense of proportion about the world. People who prefer the mechanical pleasures to such a miracle are jaded and enslaved. They are preferring the very dregs of life to the fountains of life. They are preferring the last crooked, indirect, borrowed, repeated, and exhausted things of our dying capitalist civilization to the reality which is the only rejuvenation of all civilization. It is they who are the hugging the chains of their old slavery. It is the child who is ready for the new world. If we have forgotten this, our society is failing. God told Adam and Eve to be fruitful and multiply. Children throughout history have been seen as a blessing. In a Catholic context, Our Lady of Fatima told us that the final battle would be over the family. It certainly appears that she and Chesterton were correct. We are seeing the effects of devastation and despair in our universally declining birth rates. So, have some babies. <laughs> this is the first and most important thing you can do to contradict the anti-human and anti-Christ spirit of the age. Procreate. <laughs> have children and then raise them to know and love and serve the Lord in this world and to be happy with him in the next. And if you can't have babies, and I am not minimizing this, and G.K. and Francis knew the cross of infertility well, I'm at a point where I can't have any more babies, so what am I gonna do? I can't go stealing other people's babies, as tempting as it might be, but I need to make it easier for somebody else to have babies. When a child is born, a whole new universe is created, an eternal soul. Human beings don't reproduce, we procreate. That is, we cooperate with the Creator to bring a new eternal soul into existence. And that eternal soul brings with it infinite value. You have the power, through your thoughts, words, and deeds, to make it easier for others to have children. Babysitting, meals, clothing, time spent with grandchildren, nieces, and nephews are all critical. But this support can also be as simple as a smile at an exhausted mother or a word of encouragement to a father doing his best to support a family. Fostering and promoting a cultural attitude where children are seen as essential and good seems very basic, but it is necessary. Those of you who have businesses, make your policies such that they recognize the primacy of the family through a just wage, parental leave, and flexible and human accommodations. Your business exists for the families it employs and serves and a successful business will act accordingly. Okay. Appreciate beauty. Grow the pumpkin. Instead of being a stockbroker dealing with the idea of pumpkins, or maybe in addition to being a stockbroker, grow some pumpkins. Have a garden. Go for a hike. Develop a hobby that doesn't cost anything or have a screen. Once you have a harvest, share it with your friends and neighbors. Backyard farming doesn't have to be complicated and can even include small livestock like chickens. That's our chicken coop. <laughs> Build beauty into your life with a flower garden. Take time to appreciate the small things. 
Life can be difficult even in the best of circumstances. Take time to intentionally bring the beauty of nature into your life and the lives of your children. My husband and I were fortunate to take a continuing um, parent education class and the subject matter was a book that I recommend along with Outline of Sanity called um, Leisure is the Basis of Culture by Joseph Pieper. Okay. The lesson that I learned from this excellent book is that in order to have a relationship with God, we must be able to appreciate created beauty. And in order to ap appreciate created beauty, we must be able to contemplate nature. That is, we're forming our soul, we're forming our moral, um, our moral imagination by participating in beauty. So this got me thinking. One of my sons is, you know, I homeschool, and one of my sons is obsessed with geography. So he had been asking for quite some time to go to Glacier National Park. We lived in Illinois, and Glacier National Park is on the other side of 800 miles of Montana and plenty of other, so it's really far away away. Um, but I, I thought about it, and I said, well, you know, I want my kids to, to be interested in nature, and also, you know, like any, any child, they're seduced by video games. So I made a deal. I proposed a deal, and they accepted. I said, if we give up the electronic devices for the summer, we could go on the trip across the country, visiting national parks along the way with Glacier as our destination. They stuck to their end of the bargain, and we had a wonderful summer at home with no electronics and a lot of playing outside. Once the summer ended and all the other children were back in school, we headed out for the less crowded parks in our adventure. So now is the part where I get to spam you with pictures of my children. <laughs> So this is us, we're in the van, all packed up, it's packed to the gills, ready to go. What you can't see is my mother and my aunt in their own vehicle, following along behind. My husband, of course, is, is an excellent provider, so he couldn't come along for a two week long crazy escapade, but he was definitely there in, um, in spirit and in all of his sport. So um, the kids are ready to go, electronics are still stowed. This is this is actually Minnesota, which was on the way out of town. Yes, so woohoo, Minnesota. And then, um, oh, this was great. So we're still, you know, we're decompressing. So we got to visit the aliens, but this talk will not be about extraterrestrials. <laughs> okay. And then this is uh, this is where we really started to feel it, right? We're in um, Teddy Roosevelt National Park here. That's the Little Mo River. My children started to go a little feral. Yeah, little feral. <laughs> <laughs> I loved it, you know, and they really started to relax. You know, at the beginning of the trip, I mean, we're so tightly wound when we're in, in our culture, you know, things are coming at us from every direction. So even though we've taken an electronics fast, um, you know, there's still a lot of fighting, but, you know, we were on an adventure and they, they really banded together. There was a, a time of great growth. You know, even as we were learning to appreciate um, nature, we were also learning to appreciate one another. Yeah, this is the feral two-year-old. I loved it. I mean, he looks like a little, it's like little Lord of the Flies. <laughs> okay, and finally, after 800 miles, did I say it was 800 miles in Montana? Yes, it was, it was very long. Um, we ended up in Glacier National Park, so that's when we first arrived. Um, after the ranger had told us he was tracking the um, bear through the campsite. So be careful and keep the kiddos close. Um, what an adventure. I mean, what an adventure. So we, um, oh, I, I took out a picture. I'll show you later. If you ask me, I'll show an amazing picture of the kids in, in Glacier Fed Lake. But, you know, this, this majesty was what provoked my then seven-year-old son to say to me, um, Wow, you know, we, the only mountains we had ever seen before this were the Appalachian Mountains, and they're significantly older, and while they're majestic, they're nothing like the Rockies. Uh -huh. He sees these mountains and he says, Wow, Mom, did, did God really make those? Yep. Yep. Absolutely, and he wanted you to see them. Oh. Yeah. Oh, wow, Mom. And, and he made me too. <laughs> yeah, you're getting it, you know? That was worth it. That was worth 800 miles of Montana. <laughs> so that was the point, to spend time in creation. For the next week, we soaked in the beauty of God's creation at Glacier National Park. During this time, my children learned invaluable lessons. They could learn no other way. In the beauty of creation, they saw a loving father and gained some idea 
about the beauty and immensity of the universe. Since then, we have taken many similar trips, some in our backyard and some many miles away. Children need to be exposed to nature as a prerequisite for a relationship with God and a necessary precursor to appreciating created beauty. If you don't have children, you can con into a deal to exchange technology for a trip to a national park. You have neighbors who can go for a hike. You can support the local 4-H club or scouting program. You can offer to help someone take their kids for a day in nature. You can appreciate it yourself. You must not underestimate the value of appreciating nature and its creator ourselves. By doing so, we become more fully alive and can help elevate our culture by our presence and our connection to our Creator. And once you have built the foundation of a relationship with the Creator through the natural world, you can have an appreciation for art. The experiences in nature have formed your soul to be able to see and appreciate beauty. One way you can do this is to visit art galleries to see the masters. When my children and I plan our homeschooling trips, museums are always on the agenda. With a sketchbook in hand, we practice really seeing the art. The foundational work we have done in creation is necessary to be able to see beauty, which is more objective than we sometimes think. Memorize and appreciate poetry. Every year on the Feast of Our Lady of the Rosary, we listen to a reading of Lepanto, taking notes and learning to listen. Art is a necessary part of our curriculum. In order to for, fully form the human person, we must teach appreciation of art and allow our children to develop their own talent. Art education is not extra, it is a necessary part of forming the human soul. In addition to art, it is also important that children learn to make something with their hands. Let me show you some pretty art first. That's Lepanto. And that's my daughter's artwork. She copied the prayer card. <laughs> she, was, she was seven years old. <coughs> Sculptors, this is GK now. Sculptors do not want to turn a statue out with a lathe or painters to print off a picture as a pattern. And a craftsman who was really capable of making pots or pans would be no readier to condescend to what is called manufacturing them. It is odd, by the way, that the very word manufacture means the opposite of what it is supposed to mean, mm -hmm. right? Manu, hands, facture, make. It is a testimony to a better time when it did not mean the work of a modern factory. In the strict meaning of words, a sculptor does manufacture a sculptor, a statue, and a factory worker does not manufacture a screw. But anyhow, a world in which there were many independent men would probably be a world in which there were more individual craftsmen. When we have created anything like such a world, we may trust it to feel more than the modern world does, the danger of machinery deadening creation and the value of what it deadens. And I suggested that such a world might very well make special provision about machines, as we all do about weapons, admitting them for particular purposes, but keeping watch on them in particular ways. And this one I love. This is all from Outline of Sanity, right, by the way. All these moral ideas, you know, unless I tell you it's from someplace else, this is straight from his book on economics. So it's a lot of talking about morals for a book on economics, if you thought it was just about the numbers. We are concerned to create a particular sort of men. The men who will not worship machines, even if they use machines. I want, to be, I want to be a man like that. All of this preparation is leading to the ultimate appreciation of creation, and that is a relationship with the Creator. The contemplation of nature and creative beauty makes the soul ripe for the contemplation of the Creator. This is necessary in order to produce a more fully formed human person. This is Chesterton. I say the new home must not be only a home, but a shrine. And that is why I say it must be first established in England, in the homes of our fathers and the shrines of our saints, to be a light and an ensign to our children." End quote. You can't give what you don't have. Being immersed in beauty is a preparation for a relationship with God. Chesterton again, it is impossible to deny 
it is impossible to deny that there is a doctrine behind the whole of our political position. It is not necessarily the doctrine of the religious authority, which I myself receive. So this is for everybody, not just for Catholics, so evangelize widely. But it cannot be denied that it must, in a sense, be religious. That is to say, it must at least have some reference to an ultimate view of the universe, and especially to the nature of man. That's the problem with the socialist idea, right? It doesn't understand the nature of man. That is, one does not have to be a Catholic to be a distributist or localist, but one does have to subscribe to the theory of natural law. After all, the economy is made for the man, not the other way around. A good and just economic system must respect the rights and dignity of man. Of course, as a Catholic, Chesterton found God in prayer and the liturgy. Lex serendi, lex credendi, as you pray, so you believe. The liturgy ought to be beautiful, because the faith is beautiful, and God is beauty itself. With prayer, too, the family is foundational. The place a child learns to worship God is the home, through activities which inspire beauty. The place where babies are born, where men die, where the drama of mortal life is acted, is not an office or a shop or a bureau. It is something much smaller in size and much larger in scope. And while nobody would be such a fool as to pretend that it is the only place where people should work, or even the only place where women should work, it has a character of unity and universality that is not found in any of the fragmentary experiences of the division of labor. These suggestions can be implemented under any political or economic system. The fight against plutocracy remains relevant regardless of the means in which the powerful choose to coalesce power. Chesterton asked us, why revile an intolerable slavery that must be tolerated? But when we in turn ask why our ideal is impossible, or even why the evil is indestructible, they answer, in effect, because you cannot persuade people to want it destroyed, possibly, but on their own showing, they cannot blame us because we try. He, he wants us to try. They cannot say that people do not hate plutocracy enough to kill it, and then blame us for asking them to look at it enough to hate it. They will not attack it until they hate it. And then they are doing the most practical thing we can do in showing it to be hateful. A moral movement must begin somewhere, but I do most positively postulate that there must be a moral movement. This is not a financial flutter or a police regulation or a private bill or a detail of bookkeeping. It is a nightly effort of the will of man. Like the throwing off of any other great evil, or it is nothing. I say that if men will fight for this, they may win. I have nowhere suggested that there is any way of winning without fighting. That's the, we bless the chicken coop. <laughs> over and over, the church tells us in her teaching that the aim of the human person is eternity with God. Any philosophy that does not have the kingdom of God as its aim is ultimately doomed to fail. As Pius XI points out in Quadragesimo Anno, the sordid love of wealth, which is the shame and great sin of our age, will be opposed in actual fact by the gentle yet effective law of Christian moderation, which commands man to seek first the kingdom of God and his justice with the assurance that, by the virtue of God's kindness and unfailing promise, temporal goods also, insofar as he has need of them, shall be given to him besides. By forming our moral conscience and developing the ability to see and participate in beauty, we inoculate ourselves against the degradation of the system, which seeks to force upon us the vulgar millionaire's notion of the taste of the most vulgar millions. So fight we must. The practices I've outlined in this talk foster conditions that are ripe for distributism and localism to take hold. If we want to disincentivize capitalism and defang socialism, we must make ourselves difficult to govern and control. We must value things which cannot be bought. 
We have to worship babies. This means having different motives. People who, who make choices that might be economically harmful but spiritually good are difficult for capitalists to manipulate. People who aren't afraid to die are impossible to be controlled by totalitarian governments. In the fight to create a more just world which honors creation and meets all the needs of humanity, we must begin with the institution for which all others exist, the family, and the people within, especially the children. I'm not trying to give you a prescription, but to encourage that your efforts matter. The home, as Chesterton says, is larger on the inside. Our efforts to create an environment which allows our family to seek truth and beauty is not in vain. This fight is our fight, and we are all in the battle. Have hope. St. Teresa of Calcutta tells us that we are not called to be successful, but faithful. As Chesterton reminds us, for at present, we all tend to one mistake. We tend to make politics too important. We tend to forget how huge a part of a land, man's life is the same under a sultan and a senate, under Nero or St. Louis. Daybreak is a never-ending glory. Getting out of bed is a never-ending nuisance. <laughs> Food and friends will be welcomed. Work and strangers must be accepted and endured. Birds will go bedwards and children won't <laughs> to the end of the last evening. <laughs>